Hi, my name is Thibaut Michel. I'm a PhD student at the Australian National University in Canberra and also at Sorbonne University in Paris. In this video, I'll present some experimental work on a real-time self-testing quantum random number generator based on non-classical state. This work was done with Jing Yong Hao, Oliver Thurl, Sied Assad uh, at the ANU under the supervision of Ping Koi Lam. And it's also a collaboration with Davide Marangon, Jose Pevalon, and Paolo Villoresi from University of Padova. Here is the outline for this talk. I'll first give some context and motivation for this work, then uh, explain the basic principle behind our self-testing QRNG before explaining the actual protocol and experimental implementation. I'll give the results and I'll conclude with some outlook on this work. So why do we need random numbers to begin with? Well, there's a broad range of application for random numbers. But given this is a cryptography conference, uh, I think you'll all be familiar with quantum key distribution. And uh, QKD protocols require random numbers, uh, but these need to be secure and independent. So the requirement on the random numbers are quite high in order for the protocol to be loophole free. In particular, uh, you can't use uh, pseudo random numbers that are generated uh, algorithmically because they are intrinsically flawed. So this would compromise the security of your protocol. This has led researcher to try and harness the randomness uh, from quantum system because it can be uh, provably secure and is intrinsic. So to give a nice overview of the different types of uh, QRNG, it's quite neat to plot them on a graph like this, where on the x-axis you have the security of the device or the paranoia level of the owner of the device. And then on the vertical axis, you have the bit rate uh, to the speed of the device, also the ease of implementation. Then on the upper left corner of such graphs, you'd find the trusted device QRNG. Those have very high bit rates. They're easy to implement with off the shelf components, but they rely on some assumption mainly that you need to trust the measurement device and also you need to trust the source of entropy. And if you want to take into account classical noise, you have to characterize your device well. Now on the other side of the spectrum, you'd find the device independent QRNG. So these can provide fully secure random numbers independently of the measurement device or source of entropy that is certified by non-locality principle but they are a lot harder to implement and they have slow bit rates. Because of that, uh, there's been attempts at finding a compromise between those two approaches, and that is the semi-device independent QRNGs. So these are not fully secure, they're not unconditional, but they have less assumption that the trusted device QRNGs while still maintaining a very high bit rate. So our work falls into this category. Before I explain the protocol behind our work, let me take a step back and look at a classical example of a trusted device QRNG. Now, this would be a homodyne measurement on an optical field. So it'd have an entropy source. Usually uh, this would be vacuum. And then you perform a homodyne detection with a bright local oscillator on that. Um, because you have finite precision, you're measuring a, a POVM xk delta x, where delta, delta x is your precision on the quadrature measurement. And so you will get some uh, data like this. So ran, random da data points uh, that have a given distribution dependent on the input state. Now, the way to extract unbiased random numbers from that is to calculate the mean entropy, which is uh, related to the probability of an adversary uh, guessing the outputs of your QRNG. So in the case like this, where you trust your measurement device and you also trust your entropy source, then the best strategy for an adversary is just to guess um, the most likely value. So in that case, zero. And so the mean entropy is just given by this quantity. Now, in a more practical setting, your noise data actually 
has some classical path contribution C here that would come from uh, classical noise in your measurement device. And you can improve the security of your device by assuming that an adversary would have access or even control over this classical noise. And therefore, the mean entropy would need to be conditioned on the knowledge of this classical noise. And it would change to, to this quantity here, where you uh, assume that the adversary knows this classical noise and you take the worst case scenario of uh, his guessing probability. So this has been done in, uh, in this work where they actually tune their measurement parameters in order to maximize the extractable randomness. To improve the security of uh, such a device, you could drop the assumption that the source is, is trusted. Now the source could be anything. Uh, in particular, you could be measuring one mode of a two mode state where the second mode uh, is detained by an adversary and is correlated to yours. So then the, the data that you're measuring could well be correlated with what the adversary is measuring. And now the correct amount of entropy to extract is given by the conditioned mean entropy, where the conditioning is done on any classical or quantum side information. Now, one way to estimate this quantity would be to do a full tomography of your mode and then find all compatible uh, two mode states compatible with your measurements. And from that, find the worst case scenario and estimate Eve's guessing probability. But this is a bit complicated and there is a better way to estimate the mean entropy. And that is using the uh, entropic uncertainty relations. So these relation relate uh, entropies for measurement of two quadratures X and P that could be uh, conjugate quadratures of the optical field, for example. And uh, this constant C here uh, just depends on the maximum overlap between the POVM that measures uh, the quadrature P and X. Uh, now from this relation, you see that you can easily lower bound the conditional mean entropy by this quantity, which we'll call, the, uh, which we'll call in the following H low. So this lower bound can be estimated by just measurement of the P quadrature. And it allows you to estimate the conditional mean entropy on measurement of the X quadrature. And that's uh, the protocol we use will be based on, the, on this uh, entropic uncertainty relation. So we assume that the input states can be correlated to a malicious uh, third party here. And instead of measuring just one POVM X, we'll actually also sometimes measure another POVM P which corresponds to the conjugate quadrature. And we'll randomly switch between those two measurements. Now, when we measure P, we'll call that the check measurement. We'll estimate with this uh, EUR, we'll estimate a lower bound on the conditional mean entropy of X. And then when we measure X, we'll get some row numbers from our measurement and we can extract uh, the correct number of secure random numbers from the estimate that we get of the mean entropy. Now, in this protocol, there still remains some assumption. So we didn't drop any assumption on the measurement device. So this one is still fully trusted. But there's still some assumption on the source, mainly that uh, for the estimation of this bound, we require the source to be uh, independent and identically distributed. And we also require the source to be bounded. Indeed, this uh, EUR works when the POVM for P and X cover the full phase space, which of course experimentally is not the case because our detector will saturate at some point. So we assume when we use this EOR that the input state cannot saturate our measurement POVM. Here is another view of the protocol and, and device. So we have this local oscillator here that we'll use to measure either X or P, and we can lock to those two quadrature using this uh, face lock here. And on the other side, we have the entropy source, which can be uh, many things. And we'll, in the, in the following, we'll try uh, thermal state and squeeze state in particular. Now we also have some beam blocks on the source and uh, local oscillator. 
so that every time we do a measurement, we can uh, block the beams, record the dark noise, and then block the source and record the short noise. This will allow us to calibrate what POVM we are actually measuring. Uh, and now if we are measuring P, that's our check measurement, we'll collect data and estimate a low bound on the conditional mean entropy using the uh, entropic uncertainty principle. So that's this measurement here. And uh, we'll use the frequentist estimator for this quantity. Now, when we go to the actual quadrature that we're interested in, the data quadrature X, we can collect the data and then we'll hash it accordingly to the entropy bound we estimated before. And then we can repeat and alt alternatively switch uh, between those two quadratures and we do that randomly. So in this context, uh, this can be seen as a randomness amplification device because we do need some uh, random numbers to begin with because uh, we have some random, random quadrature switching here. And also the hashing uh, algorithm that we use is the toplix metric al algorithm, and it does require uh, random numbers. So in our particular case, this seed and, uh, and the random numbers for the hashing were extracted using an other, another QRNG that is a trusted device one. And in this conference, they, there is a talk about this, uh, this QRNG that I recommend you, you follow. Our QRNG is uh, real time. All the data acquisition and uh, quadrature switching was done live, as well as a beam blocking for estimating the classical noise of our detection device and the short noise. So in that regard, it's self-testing, self-calibrating and self-sustaining. We also uh, ran it with a non-classical source, a squeeze state of light. And we'll show that uh, using this type of source, you can increase the amount of uh, randomness that you can extract. So I'll give a few words about squeeze states. The squeeze states are non-classical states uh, that exhibit uh, noise on one quadrature of the electromagnetic field that is below the shot noise limit. To respect the Eisenberg and Santanchi principle, the other quadrature uh, needs to be anti squeeze that is, the noise is above the short noise limit. And these states have uh, many applications. Uh, the most successful one might be in quantum metrology, so they can be used, for example, for gravitational wave sensing, and they have been used for that. Uh, they're also used uh, in communication protocols, like uh, QKD, by generating uh, entangled EPR states. And they can be used as well for quantum information processing. So here is a schematic view of our experiment. And we tried the protocol with two different uh, states. We tried a thermal state source and a squeeze state source. The thermal state source was generated using phase and amplitude modulators, in which we send a white Gaussian electronic noise and by tuning the variance of this noise, uh, we are able to tune the, the variance of the thermal state generated. This thermal state was interested as a proof of principle of our protocol. Here are the results for the thermal states. In solid blue line here is the theoretical value for the entropy bound that we need to calculate. And in red solid line is the unconditional mean entropy of the data quadrature. So this this red line here is the amount of uh, random numbers you would extract uh, if you assume the source is trusted. So when you have a thermal state, when the, when the variance increases, the apparent noise in your signal increases, so the red line goes up. But the amount of trusted randomness in there actually goes down because this thermal state can be purified into an EPR state, in which case uh, the, the, the higher the variance of the state, the higher the uh, possible correlation with a third party. In other words, the blue line here is the trusted amount of randomness, whereas the red line is the untrusted randomness. Now the dashed line uh, represents simulation of uh, the estimation of the bound for the conditional mean entropy, taking into account finite data size, because we our samples for estimating this bound are finite. So they will only reach the blue line here, the solid line for in the asymptotic limit. So we start with a given random, uh, given thermal state 
and we run the protocol. And at some point we get to the check quadrature randomly. And so we estimate the value for the bound on the conditional mean entropy and we get this value. Then uh, the protocol we switch to the other quadrature extracts some random numbers and then at some point randomly switch back to estimating uh, the randomness and it will get another point. And we repeat this process several times. And then we do it for another variance, another input state, etc. So by doing this, we check that indeed, when the thermal state gets bigger, the uh, amount of trusted randomness doesn't go up, but goes down. We then run the protocol with a squeeze state source that regenerates it with a doubly resonant OPA cavity. Now, this state is interesting because it allows us to increase the amount of randomness that we can extract. Indeed, when you measure some variance below the shot noise on the check quadrature P, well, that's a sign that the state has some purity and it's a sign that the excedent noise on the other quadrature, the data quadrature X, cannot be accessed by a malicious party. So the, the more squeezing you measure one quadrature, the more secure randomness is available on the anti-squeeze quadrature. And so here is a plot showing the same quantities as before. And you can see that as the quadrature squeezing, uh, the check quadrature squeezing increases, the amount of randomness that we can extract also increases. And this amount is greater than for a vacuum state, for example. So say if you have 5 dB squeezing, you can increase the amount of randomness that you would extract compared to vacuum by approximately 10%. As I mentioned before, we only have a finite size of sample to estimate the entropy bound. So this entropy bound that we represented in the first graph here uh, as a blue dashed line depends on the underlying uh, probability distribution behind our measurements. So as we have a finite sample size to estimate it, uh, and we use uh, frequencies to estimate the probabilities, we will overestimate uh, this, bind, this bound. And as we increase the uh, number of samples for estimating this bound, our estimate will get better, but it's always positively biased. That can be a problem because this would lead to an overestimation of the uh, number of bits you can extract. And I should mention in our experiment, the number of samples we used for the estimation was 16,000. So because of this, we looked at uh, different uh, other estimators that you could use uh, for this bound that don't use uh, the frequency, the frequencies of different bins. And that's what we plotted uh, on the second graph here for a vacuum input state. Uh, I won't go into the details of uh, the different estimates that we have, but we found some that uh, for this input state are negatively biased, which would not lead to a uh, uh, compromising the security of the device. But keep in mind that this bias uh, is state dependent. So this is true for a Gaussian state, but if you take uh, another type of states, maybe these estimates would still be positively biased. So it's not perfect. I'll finish by giving a few words on how we can relax the two assumptions that remain on the source in our case. If you remember correctly, these two assumptions where the uh, IID assumption and the bounded source assumption. The ID assumption was necessary for estimation of the max entropy of the check quadrature P from which we extracted the bound. And so as we collect a finite sample from which we try to estimate this quantity, we assume that the quantum state does not change within this uh, sampling. But this assumption can be relaxed by using smooth entropic quantities. And in particular, there's a smooth version of the entropic entity relations. And by using those smooth entropic quantities, you can calculate in a similar way a bound on the smooth mean entropy. And then uh, this would relax the uh, IID assumption. The second assumption on the state was that it is bounded. This assumption comes about because the entropic uncertainty principle assumes POVM that spans the entire phase space. And in practical, you have a finite measurement range. So you have to assume 
that your input state cannot saturate your measurement range. In other words, its uh, energy is bounded. So in our case, we just considered this assumption was satisfied and uh, rounds with external values, if there were any, were discarded. But uh, we can improve on that and relax this assumption using modified version of the entropic uncertainty principles. Um, and if you look at this uh, modified version, they actually converge to the original entropic uncertainty principle as long as your measurement range is large compared to the spread of the source. To conclude, we demonstrated a real-time self-testing QRG that's based on non-classical light. Uh, we tested our protocol with different sources and we demonstrated the advantage of using squeeze light as a source. Now, in our case, the squeeze light was generated using an OPA cavity, which meant our ultimate speed of the QRNG uh, was going to be limited by the cavity bandwidth. So speed was not our main concern and we are limited to rates around uh, tens of kilobits per second. However, this uh, speed limitation can be overcome uh, by using a uh, dedicated hardware for hashing, which we didn't, uh, and also broadband squeezing, which now is available up to uh, terahertz frequencies. And also for the beam blocking and so calibration of the device, you could use uh, optical beam switching to not be limited by uh, the speed of those beam blocks. And finally, all this uh, device can be miniaturized uh, with on-chip squeezes and on-chip homodyne detection. Thank you for watching. If you want to have further details on this work, uh, you can check out our paper or attend the live talk I'll give on Friday the 14th. And also feel free to ask me any question by email if you want. Thank you.